Hi, Dan. Hey, Bob. How are you doing? Uh, doing pretty well. It's the first warm day in uh, the Boston area in quite some time. Well, congratulations on that. Thank you. Let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show. You're Dan Dresner, familiar to many Blogging Head viewers, because for one thing, you're a co-host of Dresbert, along with uh, Heather Hurlbert, which appears a little less frequently <laughs> than I would like, but I'm grateful to have it on the site nonetheless. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. That's... Uh, that was some good guilting via the blogging. Yeah, okay. I appreciate so we're that. done now. That's all I wanted to do is publicly shame you. And uh, There we go. I feel publicly shamed. It's been Heather, great chatting. I, I, this is all me. Heather has nothing to do with this. Go ahead. Uh, <laughs> and you're also, let me try to get back uh, in your great, good graces, uh, author of The Ideas Industry, How Thought Leaders Are Ushering in the Apocalypse. No, that wasn't the subtitle. What was the subtitle? Uh, it's how pessimist partisans and plutocrats are transforming the marketplace of ideas. Okay. Oh, I was I was focusing on the subtext. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, and uh, you teach at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts and so on. And, right, and, and I you write blog, the you, Spoiler yeah. alert, yeah. Washington Post. Mm -hmm. In fact, that's what, that's what led us to be uh, in communion today, Dan. This is correct. Uh, so we had it. I believe an exchange of views would be the way to put it. Yeah. Um, this this was based on a Vox column that you wrote um, regarding uh, basically the role that that sort of never Trump conservatives should play in the resistance is not quite the word I would want to use, but presumably uh, the anti-Trump coalition um, in which you were a little harsher, I think, than I was. I was a little harsher on Bill Crystal. You were harsher on me than I was, although not very harsh. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. And then and I did what I do when I'm brutally attacked by someone on the Internet. I said, well, do you want to talk about this on Blogging Heads, damn it? And usually they say no, and I have the satisfaction of being able to think of them as cowards. You disappointed me and said, sure. Um and because so I, being when someone disagrees with me on the Internet, often like to actually say, OK, well, what exactly is the source of the disagreement? Let's try to work this out. Oh, that's much too much too civil. No, that's what we're here to do. We're going to work this out. Mm -hmm. uh, and l let me I mean, uh, let me say like my version of what my argument was. OK. And and Vox put a headline on it that I think steered it more in the direction of what you critiqued. But. Still, uh, it started out as actually a little item I wrote in the Mindful Resistance newsletter, which people can sign up for at mindfulresistance.net. The alert folks at Vox spotted it and asked if they could reprint it with modest amendment. Okay. And uh, and then they put this headline on it, uh, which I think helps account for the way you put it. You said, oh, okay, over at Vox, Robert Wright is having none of this. He goes to great lengths to explain why the left should not make peace with the neoconservatives. Now, I'm not against not making peace with the neoconservatives, but but the 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 argument, what it, what it really riffed on was this Ben Wittes. Did you see the original Ben Wittes tweet storm about... Uh, I believe that originally started as a Facebook uh, sort of post that he put up like back in the spring but didn't get any attention ah. and then he tweet stormed it and it did generate a fair amount of attention but please exp you know go on so he wrote basically he was saying everyone in the anti-trump coalition needs to get along so basically we should not as i understood it we should not air disagreements among ourselves here's what he wrote mm -hmm. we have grave disagreements about social issues about important foreign policy questions about tax policy about whether entitlement should be reformed or expanded about what sort of judges should serve on our courts i believe in putting them all aside i believe in a temporary truce on all such questions an agreement to maintain this and blah 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 and i said that's crazy i'm not going to like not air my differences with bill crystal just because he professes to be against trump and so that was the argument. Now, you're, it's true that I was, as I am inclined to be when the name Bill Crystal comes up, <laughs> drawn into a more thoroughgoing denouncement of, of Crystal. And, and uh, the way I put it was, uh, the truth is, well, what I said was, you know, this mindful resistance thing that I'm uh, involved in uh, tries to look at the forces that gave rise to Trump and Trumpism and uh, address them. And I said, the truth is, Bill Crystal in many ways embodies many of these uh, forces that, that led to Trump. And so, uh, so, this is a, so this is a good jumping off point, because I, I think we I, I do want to have the larger conversation, but I think Crystal's role in particular, I mean, and this is one thing where I think I wrote where I said, in some ways, 
you weren't hard enough on Crystal because I would argue that it, in many ways the key moment, the, the the most culpable moment that Crystal played, or, or the most culpable moment for Crystal in terms of the rise of Trump, was his embrace of Sarah Palin. Right. Um, because Sarah Palin is the gateway drug that gave us Donald Trump. Mm-hmm. Um, when Sarah Palin became the vice president, you know, Bill Crystal embraced her, said she was a breath of fresh air, you know, and, and in some ways, the well, one he, thing he, that, he is he is possibly responsible for her being the vice presidential candidate. Right, I mean, he pushed the, her hard. Yeah. He actually, I think, I think was one of the sources that, you know, got her on on John McCain's or on the campaign team's uh, radar. And, but but Crystal, even more so than many of the others who backed Palin, at least nominally in 2008, stuck by her, I think, well past that. I mean, I believe as late as 2014, you know, Crystal thought it was, you know, an interesting idea for her to resign, you know, in mid governorship uh, in Alaska, thinking that this could actually be a great way for her to run for president in 2012, you know, constantly talked her up in no small part because she was such a populist, um, because she was, you know, there Say what you will about Sarah Palin. The one I, I think I, I remember saying this a long time ago in a blogging heads with Megan McArdle. I said the one authentic aspect of Sarah Palin's personality is her utter resentment of elites that mm-hmm. she feels herself marginalized by them. And you can argue that is the thing that she shares with Trump. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the things. The other thing is the sort of know nothing nature of her um, of her sort of discussion of politics and policy. Although, frankly, Sarah Palin is a savant compared to Donald Trump, um, you know, in, in, in many ways. So I, I, w- that's the point where I, I do agree with you. I think, I think Crystal does individually have, you know, something of a role in terms of, of creating the, the political conditions that got us to where we are with Donald Trump. Yeah. Um, I actually, you know, realized that, after I wrote the thing and after uh, I read your critique, I, 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 in fact, only last night it dawned on me that there's another sense in which um, that I didn't articulate, in which Crystal represents a lot of the forces of, of Trumpism. Here's what happened. Uh, somebody who's going to inter- interview Crystal, perhaps having seen my box piece, emailed yeah. me and said, uh, are there any things you think I should ask Crystal? And so that led me to uh, Google my Chris, Bill Crystal oeuvre, the several <laughs> things I've, I've uh, written about Crystal. Um, and, and let me give you the laundry list in, in, in indictment. I, I mean, okay. first of all, let's say that among the things Trumpism uh, represents are um, uh, playing to people's fears, Islamophobia being a prime example, um, playing to people's tribalism, um, Doing so dishonestly in a specifically McCarthyite fashion, sometimes whether it's like guilt by association or or quoting anonymous people and say, you know, people are saying blah blah blah, you know, mm. the anonymous smear also McCarthyite thing. And I looked at these three things I'd written about Crystal, and and uh, and here is the uh, here is here are the three. So first. You know, Bill Kristol was the editor of the Weekly Standard until very, very recently. Now he's an editor at large. But while he was editor of the Weekly Standard, you remember the so-called Ground Zero mosque controversy. They wanted to build a mosque yeah. near the, the what had been the Twin Towers. Right. Uh, the guy who wanted to do it, so far as I could tell, perfectly earnest, well-meaning imam. I met him once. Uh, some people on the right were opposed. I was appalled that they were opposed. But, right. but the Weekly Standard was uh, uh, wrote a piece against it. And, and here was their line, one of their lines of attack in the piece. Hold on, they, but wait, but one second. The, so the Weekly Standard actually wrote an editorial against it, or was it just well, a I don't count? know, but, but look, when Bill Crystal, I don't know if it's an editorial piece. Bill Crystal was editor of the Weekly Standard. And so, and let me say, at a minimum, if you're, if you're uh, uh, an editor, pieces that run should meet your standards for integrity in journalism, if nothing okay, else. Okay, and so yeah. here's what the piece argued. It said, uh, among other things, it said, this imam has a wife who has an uncle. And this uncle, the uncle of the wife of the imam, used to be, used to be, he's no longer, but he used to be the head of a mosque. And this mosque now has a website. The uncle of the wife of the imam is no longer the head of it, but now the mosque has a website. The website links, there's a link on the website, to the website of a group that we disapprove of. I forget the group. It's radical or something. Okay, so this is just classic guilt by association. It's Islamophobic. It's playing to people's... Okay, so that's that. The the uh, the two more data points are 
uh, when when uh, Chuck Hagel was being nominated, the Weekly Standard, uh, Bill Crystal writes a piece saying Chuck Hagel is anti-Israel. Well, I would argue with that. I would also argue that he means that as code for anti-Semitic. Anyway, you don't have to decode it because they also ran a byline piece by someone else saying, uh, quoting an anonymous Senate aide saying, if Obama sends that nomination to the Senate, this was when Hagel was uh, being nominated for defense secretary, where he did not perform well, I concede. Um, yeah. The... the uh, we, we, the entire world will find out that he's anti-Semitic. This is an anonymous, this is an anonymous aide being, again, classic McCarthyite smear on, on Bill Crystal's watch. Uh, in, in the, I don't, I don't mean the anti-Semitism is a classic McCarthyite smear, but the technique, the anonymous uh, denunciation. You, I, have, I, you have a skeptical look on your face. Well, I mean, an anonymous quote, you know, we're, we're in a world of anonymous quotes when it comes to reporting. I don't know if necessarily having an anonymous quote from right. a Senate aide. But if you're going is... to accuse someone of something scurrilous, I mean, well, we could get into the, 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 the little the data point the guy brought in later to himself yeah. argue that that uh, Hegel was uh, was anti-Semitic. It was that years ago. Back when the term Jewish lobby was used instead of the term Israel lobby, he had used the term Jewish lobby instead of the term Israel lobby. That was the actual allegation. Make of that what okay. you will. But uh, final thing uh, that that I unearthed just last night. I, it, it was not in anticipation of this. It was because I got this email asking me about Crystal. Uh, I had written about the time that the the Emergency Committee for Israel started and by Crystal um, uh, during the Iran deal. Um, mm-hmm. when, when Obama was trying to get the Iran deal done, of course, Crystal yeah. opposed that, uh, they wrote a thing saying that Iran had the fuel for five nuclear bombs. And I just wrote a piece pointing out that, well, no, I mean, they had no highly enriched uranium whatsoever that you need for fuel for a bomb. They had enough uranium such that if you had given them more than another year, right. they could have turned it into fuel. But, but I'm sorry. That's not fuel. Oil in the ground is not fuel for my car, especially if it's going to take it a year to, to, to turn it into that. And of course, you know, the Emergency Committee for Israel, as I understand it, uh, uses stuff like this to do to do or I don't even know if it's still around, but but use stuff like this to do fundraising, uh, which I imagined is consisting of kind of, you know, scaring elderly Jews in America into giving them money um, and in this case doing so dishonestly. So, mm-hmm. uh I, you know, I, I, I realized that there's another sense. I mean, the, the, the kind of, uh, you know, catering to, to people's fears in the service of bigotry like Islamophobia and tribalism um, and doing so dishonestly in McCarthyite fashion. All of that is characteristic of Trump. And uh, now we haven't yet gotten to your substantive critique, but I, but I just right. thought I would uh, tell you about this revelation I had last night that, that, that there's a different sense in which Crystal embodies Trumpism. OK, but I, so. Without knowing the details of these things, I mean, let me put it this way, I will certainly I think one thing that you raised, which is certainly valid, is that you can argue that the only way that Donald Trump rises within the GOP is because you potentially have a sort of conservative press that is that has stoked. I mean, this goes to I think I want to say is it Charlie Sykes? Is it um, you know the the former talk show host, uh, conservative talk show host, who talked about the fact that you know I think he was based in Wisconsin. That talked yeah, about yeah. the fact that essentially one of the problems that conservatives have, ha- have had for, is that they've torn at the mainstream media for so long. That when someone goes too far and just totally makes stuff up and conservatives, they say, well, no, that's not actually true. See, the Post debunked it. The Times debunked it. The Wall Street Journal debunked it. You know, the sort of Trump type people don't want to hear that, you know, so that that even within conservatives, fact checking has become extremely difficult um, because of the low degree of trust. Um, I think that's so, probably true. Yeah. Yeah. But- so, I mean, that and, and to the extent that Crystal aided and abetted that that's a a, you know that's a a a fair point and and to be clear i wasn't trying to say that crystal held no culpability you know in terms of getting us to the moment we have now no in fact you brought up the sarah palin point which was valid right my point is is that okay acknowledging all that and acknowledging you know particularly 
if you're on the left, the the resentment you might have towards this. The one thing you can say, and this is where you know, I mean, and this is something that Heather Herbert and I have talked about a lot on Dresbert, and I and I, I think I was actually proven right on this, was that I said, you know, most of the conservative foreign policy intelligentsia, including all of the neoconservatives, almost all that I know, you know, were implacably opposed to Trump from day one because they didn't see him as being fit to be commander in chief. And one of the fascinating things to me was that Heather predicted, you know, I, I was one of many signatories to the Never Trump letters and so on and so forth. And, you know, Heather was much more cynical about this, was arguing, yeah, just wait till he gets nominated and then they will all, you know, you know, flock towards him. Or once he gets appointed, they will all flock towards him. And what is interesting to me is the degree to which that didn't happen. Um, and this is not to say that there weren't individuals who I think once Trump got elected, tried to go back on their word. Um, but because they had signed these petitions publicly, were unable to do so. But I would argue that most of them, including Crystal for that matter, um, were pretty implacably opposed from day one and stayed so. Um, because, and this is the interesting question is why? Now, you know, some people claimed at the time, and I actually think this is one of, without question, one of the most, the, the most wrong-headed attacks on why neoconservatives did it, was because Trump was actually a realist. Trump opposed neoconservative you know, foreign policy, that because Trump didn't want wars everywhere, that was why neoconservatives were opposed to him, that, you know, he didn't represent their foreign policy vision, which, by the way, is the opposite of what you claimed in the in your Vox column, which is that Trump embodies these neoconservative policy ideas as president, um, which I do want to talk about some. But I, I think without question, one of the one of the odder critiques or claims made by by people who oppose these petitions was to say that Trump was actually the more pacific candidate of the two in 2016, and that as a result, once he became president, we would finally have a true realpolitik, you know, someone who would uh, would somehow ramp down America's wars uh, overseas, and that's not true at all. It turned out to be pretty much the exact opposite of that. Right. Well, that's um, my point. I mean, he did talk like that. Mm -hmm. Now, as for whether neocons uh, were truly uh, implacable, I, I mean, I, I remember after the Syrian missile strike, actually... Uh, there was a moment where it seemed like there might be a, a rapprochement. Um, I think it was Elliot Abrams who wrote a piece for the Weekly Standard saying this is the moment that he became commander in chief and lauding him and Bill Crystal approvingly tweeted it and so on. So there were signs that if he played ball, you know, they, they'd be happy to jump on board. Now, as for why they uh, by and large haven't, I don't think it's because their foreign policy is so much to his uh, to their uh, dislike, and, and, and I do want to talk about our differing views on that, mm -hmm. but I think uh, a cynical and, and, and not an explanation I'm sure of, but a not crazy explanation, is Bill Crystal. I think, has discovered that opposing Trump is excellent business. I would love to have the numbers on how much his Twitter feed has grown. I mean, it's it's massive. It's massive. Glenn Greenwald has written about this, about how the, 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 the neocons are, are using Trump to kind of rehabilitate themselves. And they now have all these like progressive followers don't remember the Iraq war uh, who, who um, you know, are retweeting them approvingly. So, I mean, in a way, Crystal has the best of both worlds. If you agree that actually Trump's foreign policy is, is, is much closer to what he'd like than you might have imagined, because he continues to... Uh, and again, I'm not saying I'm sure of this, but it's an alternative explanation. He, he continues to uh, get tons of mileage uh, out of opposing Trump on principle, while the truth is Trump's foreign policy, from his point of view, is not that bad. And I could I could list a number of senses in which I think it's probably fine with Crystal and some of the other neocons. But anyway, that's an alternative explanation. So I think that's too cynical by half. I mean, it, so I say this as someone who has periodically gone to this, there's a meeting you know, called the Meeting of the Concerned um, that, uh, among others, includes Bill Crystal, that, but that the Niskanen Institute has set up. Dave Weigel wrote about it about a month or two ago. Um, you know, that consists of other sort of prominent uh, conservatives that have basically are part of the Never Trump coalition. And let me put it this way, I mean... It, the impression I get from these, you know, the, the few meetings that I've attended and or Skyped in for is not that these people are these what these people are. Genu I think there's there's two arguments. The first is and I know this is going to sound naive, but I honestly think it's true is I think these people are genuinely appalled by Trump in a way that that you know, at, a, at a sort of gut level, the things he is, is say, you know, says are so abominable and so so 
in some ways anti-American or at least anti-American ideals that, you know, you're correct that neoconservatism obviously, you know, very strongly believes in the use of force as a, a source of good as a way of making positive social change. But it is worth pointing out that the neoconservatives actually genuinely believe in the social change part. You know, they they are genuinely not anti-immigration. They, you know, genuinely want to promote American ideals. Now, you can disagree with the means of which they want to do this. And I think that's an entirely legitimate critique. But, you know, any serious student of neoconservatives would have to acknowledge that they actually do share with liberals that sort of common set of core, you know, the, the core American creed. The thing that, by the way, Donald Trump does not um, in the sense of, you know, the one thing neoconservatives do not be believe in is what we would call blood and soil nationalism. Um, now, again, I know that sounds naive, but but seriously, the, I cannot stress the revulsion um, that yeah, I've seen. I, mean, I don't doubt that there's real revulsion. I mean, uh but let me add the second thing, which is a little – it's not exactly cynical, but it's more its more strategic, which is I do think that what the other thing that, that neoconservatives are genuinely concerned about essentially is that Trump as president will lead to a wipeout of the Republican Party. Um, that, that, that essentially Trump by sort of essentially colonizing the GOP from within has created political conditions – whereby a viable conservative party is at least going to be threatened to be wiped out for a certain period of time when the backlash comes. And they obviously don't want that for a whole variety of reasons. No, they don't. Although somebody pointed out, who uh, we can link to this piece on the uh, Democracy Journal website, one of their staffers wrote in response to my piece that, look, if if Crystal really, if Trump is, he said, what do we even mean by like, what would it mean for us to cooperate with the neoconservatives against right. Trump? I mean, if there's, if they really want to cooperate, if you look at what it would take to stop Trump, like if you want to impeach him, well, you're going to need a Democratic Congress. So if they're serious, if they want to drop everything and the main priority is stopping Donald Trump, they should support all Democrats in congressional elections. And, 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 you know, I mean, uh, so they could do that. They're not, but you're right. They're not. They're wor they're, they're worried about the Republican Party. But well, anyway, no, that's, I mean, that's I, just an asterisk. It's a. Although it, it is worth pointing out that in case of individual Democratic races, I mean, think about the Roy, you know, the Alabama race. I yeah, think most well. people we're talking about said, yeah, you got to vote for Doug Jones. It wasn't even don't vote for Roy Moore. It was vote for the decent candidate. Yeah, but it won't be. Let's help the Democrats take the take the Senate, I think. Now, I'm not. this is, again, where I'm not so sure about this, where I think that, you know, I think. I think one of the questions is, do you need a white one of the one of the debates that's been had is essentially, do you need the GOP to have a wipeout election in order to convince the remaining Republicans that mm -hmm. this is Donald Trump should not be our standard bearer? Um, so, again, well, I'm not entirely well, wait, sure. Well, wait and see. I mean, Bill Crystal's a good fundraiser. If he starts putting a bunch of money behind a bunch of Democratic candidates, I will come back and. Say, Dan Dresner, you will forever be my my guide in in uh, all matters of life. But um, but I actually think the other thing that you that the, the the thing you read is actually correct, which is to say that essentially the question becomes, what does it mean exactly to work with neoconservatives or exactly. not work with neoconservatives? Yeah, I, I don't, and that's why I wasn't even getting into that. I wasn't saying let's don't cooperate with them. I don't. Right. It's not like there's a lot of cooperation going on. I was just explaining why I'm not going to quit voicing my disagreements with them that because that's the proposition that Witt has put on the table now as for the foreign policy uh part the question another thing you questioned i mean i probably put it in a way that uh well i shouldn't have put it maybe because it's out and out wrong maybe because it was just prone to misinterpretation but when i said uh trump has been engulfed by the kind of neoconservative slash republican foreign yes. policy establishment i didn't mean the individual's we're all populating his administration. I, I meant right. that however the signals are getting to him about what to do, his policy is much closer to the traditional uh, neoconservative foreign policy than they might have feared during his campaign. And in, in, in uh, you know, I guess a, uh, a backdrop, one way to get into that is you 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 said well maybe I'm naive in characterizing the ideals of neoconservatives. Yeah. I wouldn't pass judgment on that. I would say there's a spectrum of interpretation of neoconservatives and their motivations. And at one end is they are true Wilsonians. They want to bring democracy to the world and they care about human rights and so on. At the other end is it's all about Israel. Now I, I think uh, at the other end of cynicism. 
I think the the truth is that different neoconservatives are different places on the spectrum. Now, That's with Bill it. Crystal, you can't say none of it's about Israel. The guy started the emer- the emergency committee for Israel, Bob, right? I, I got to say, I'm uncomfortable with the notion that you can reduce neoconservatism to Israel. That's no, I, I said that, but you don't deny that there are people who say that. Yeah, and I don't think much of the people who say that. Fine. I guess would be the I don't think it. much of the people at the other end. I'm just saying these are the two ends, the extreme ends of interpretation. Uh, Wait, you don't even think that's an empirical fact? I think it's. I, I think it's dangerous to to conclude that any that that the articulation of neoconservatism is primarily about Israel. I just, I don't... No, I'm not, I didn't say it was. Here's what I okay. said. I said, there are people who think that, and at the other end, there are people who, who okay. ascribe only the most noble motivations. Okay, all right, go ahead. So you're with me? Uh, go ahead. Well, wait, if you're not, disagree. This is, I can show you lots of people. You, I can show you lots, lots of, people of people who say who it's all about that. Israel. I, there are a lot, I agree, there are lots of people who think that, but I remember when we were litigating this during the Iraq War, and and... It was generally thought to be a rather abhorrent take, is my point. So, you know, I'm not... Uh... I'm not even passing judgment on it. Okay. I'm just saying right. this is the spectrum of opinion. Um, okay. And, you know, there's there's a non-trivial number of people who, who hold both views. Okay, go ahead. But I think, uh, you know, in terms of some things that, that I'm sure Bill Crystal is not unhappy about, it's that, uh, you know... There was the fear during the election that Trump was um, out and out like anti-Israel, right? I mean, there he said some things. He was talking an isolationist game. There was certainly the fear that he would not, he would be uh, not amenable to intervention in the Middle East in ways that um, America might have traditionally been amenable to, in ways that might have been helpful to Israel, at least been perceived that way uh, by Israel's leadership. Uh, and I think that set of concerns is presumably now dissipated. I mean, I think Israel's great uh, strategic fear in the region is Iran. And Trump yeah. is now fully on board uh, against Iran in a way that's maybe too militant even for, for uh, maybe for some people in the Republican establishment. I don't know, right. but there's, there's no doubt about it. Um, well, this actually, so a, a, a few things on this. The first is, is that, I mean, Trump was against the Iran deal throughout the entire campaign as well. True. And he was also extremely pro-Israel throughout the entire campaign. Yeah, but there, uh, were, the fe- there were the fears, right? Yeah, there were fears. But I mean, you know, the, let me put it this way. To the extent that Trump was consistent in his rhetoric, and he wasn't on a whole lot of, in a whole lot of ways, one of the few areas where I think he was genuinely consistent was on both Israel and Iran. Um you know, uh, but this actually gives rise to an interesting. I don't know if you've been following this. There's a fascinating debate now going on among conservatives over the degree to which sort of the never Trumpers are, you know, holding on to whatever their prior positions were, or are they shifting to the left? So, for example, there was Charles Cook, who's I believe one of the editors of the National Review, going after Jen Rubin from the Washington Post. Jen Rubin was ostensibly, you know, I think her her. Her column name, I believe, is Right Turn. You know, she was sort of the conservative columnist for the Post, but you would not get that reading Jen Rubin now, that she's sort of been implacably opposed to the Trump administration. And indeed, one of the issues upon which Cook has raised this on was Rubin's reaction to the Jerusalem announcement, which Rubin criticized Trump severely for, uh, for a variety of reasons, even while she praised, let's say, Marco Rubio for doing something similar or saying something similar back in 2010. And this is led, I think, to David Frum writing a column attacking Cook, and you know they're all. So wait, what did Jen Rubin say about Jerusalem? I believe her argument. She was pro-Trump. No, she was anti-Trump. Okay, which is surprising again, given what Jen Rubin's prior positions have were Mm -hmm. have been. And I think the question has become literally what conservatives I think are debating each other about is whether or not those who are in the Never Trump coalition or those who think of themselves as Never Trumpers are now adopting positions simply to oppose Donald Trump, or are they doing so for for one of two other possible reasons? One, which is what some people are saying, which is that these people are moving simply further to the left, that Trump has sort of forced them, you know, to move somewhat leftward. The second reason, and I actually think this is what's genuinely going on, is that there's always two dimensions when you're talking about policymaking. There's the ideological one between left and right. And I honestly don't think most of the never Trumpers have moved all that much further to the left. But then there's what I would call competent and incompetent. Um, in other words, there's whether or not you actually think these people are executing a policy that you might think in the end might be a good idea, but are you doing so in a way that actually discredits the policy? 
And that is the one signal thing that this Trump, this administration excels at doing, which is even on policies that, you know, for example, neoconservatives might support, for example, the recognition of Jerusalem eventually as the capital of Israel. They think these things are being done in such a way Mm -hmm. as to actually undercut the the valid arguments that might have been made for doing them. And it, it, this has been true with Trump with respect to foreign policy, which is he continually takes steps that are neither as bold as he prominently announces them, but at the same time don't quite adhere to the status quo and in the end wind up making a mess of things. Right. This is the case with the announcement of the Iran deal. This has been the case with the renegotiation of NAFTA. This has been the case with the um, – uh, 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 I'm sorry, with the Jerusalem decision as well, yeah. where and frankly, it's the case with the national security strategy, which is just a bundle of contradictions. Well, I've heard people, fairly knowledgeable people say at least a couple of months ago, even Bibi knew that it wasn't a good idea to actually move the embassy to Jerusalem. Right. It's a great talking point for him, but he yeah. doesn't want it to actually happen. And, right. and and if, and 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 so that's consistent with what you're saying. I mean, Trump, if anything, in some ways, you know, he's too, you know, he's gone too far from the point of view of some of these people. Now, now, as for the how predictable any of this was, you're, you're right that he was doing the pro-Israel talking points as candidates tend to do, and and it's true that he was kind of anti-Iran for I think a weird combination of reasons. One was just the Iran deal was Obama's deal. Yeah. Case closed. And, yeah. and the other is is that, you know, Bannon's uh, clash of civilizations mentality, I don't know how influential that was at the time, seems to, for reasons I don't totally understand, seems to see Iran as the embodiment of the radical Islam that it is our destiny to oppose until the apocalypse or something. For whatever reason, um, I think, uh, you know, it's you might have been able to predict those two things. On the other hand, Trump was sounding and sometimes talking this non-interventionist game as if he's got to withdraw from the world. And I think that scared uh, conservatives and, and, you know, hawks and and neocons. Um, The other thing is he was definitely talking up Russia. And the irony there is that the Russia scandal for most of this administration so far has made it politically impossible for him to embrace Russia. Now, there have been overtures lately, but... uh, but but that's what I mean when I when I say that in ways that weren't totally predictable, his foreign policy has wound up being, you know, from a neoconservative point of view, not that objectionable. He's doing the Cold War, you know, and, and, and also with China, again, not for classically neocon reasons, but he's kind of rattling some sabers and and God knows North Korea, he's rattling as many sabers probably as they want. So it's just turned out. I, I think his foreign policy has turned out more to the liking of, of hawks and neocons uh, on the right, hawks on the right and neocons than might have been predicted. So, I mean, I guess one of the differences here is between what you would consider just serious hawks and, and neoconservatism as a philosophy, which is to say that, yeah, obviously, you know, neoconservatives see North Korea as a threat. They see China as a threat. They see Russia as a threat. There are probably elements of the national security strategy, particularly the notion that China and Russia are revisionist powers that neoconservatives would like. The problem, again, is that they see Trump as the worst vessel imaginable right. for trying to execute these policies because yeah. they don't, you know, he's he's not constant on anything. He doesn't have, you know, coherent vision. And by the way, it's not like he's staffed up terribly well on the foreign policy side of things. I mean, outside of James Mattis as the Secretary of Defense, I can't think of a single national, and maybe Nikki Haley to some extent, and particularly for neoconservatives. Neoconservatives love Nikki Haley. I can't think of another, you know, sort of uh, national security professional who's acquitted themselves well within this administration. And many of them have done things that have wound up, you know, bringing their reputation way, way down. Yeah, but Nikki Haley is a good example of somebody who don't you think she is a darling of kind of hardcore neocons? Yes, that I would agree with completely. Um, and and but people are talking noting, about her as the next Secretary of State. Now nah, she's not going to be the next Secretary of State. In no small part because one of the thing, reasons that neoconservatives have liked her is because she's actually occasionally said something positive about human rights um, to the point where she's actually contradicted Trump a few times, mm. which is one of the reasons why I don't think anyone thinks Trump is going to appoint Haley as Secretary of State once Rex Tillerson finally walks away. Wow, you're giving him much more credit for intellectual coherence than I'm prepared to do. I, I, oh, I, I, I don't the, even remember the stuff about human rights. when the- No, let me be clear. It's not intellectual coherence for Trump. It's the fact that one of his cabinet 
cabinet officers is speaking in a way that Trump sees as contradicting him. I see. That's yeah, the problem. That it's not has nothing to do forget. with. Let me be very clear about this. Yeah. This has nothing to do with ideology with Trump. And if you know, again, you're talking to someone who's written 180 something tweets about Trump acting like a toddler. This is all about Trump. You know, seeing his subordinates as actually being subordinate to him. Yeah. Um. You know, so I, I don't know. Uh, on foreign policy, we're maybe sixty percent agreement about where he is, and also on uh, you know, and I can I can well imagine that although some neoconservatives could be saying, well, this is kind of closer to the kind of thing we liked than I'd imagine, they're still horrified. Yeah, they could be legitimately horrified by him being the vessel. Right, that's my a, point. Again. I think what they're concerned about is you know, in some even in the cases where he's doing something that they, they might support the 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 principle of it because he's the vessel they're worried that essentially it's going to get discredited or essentially it will you know it'll wind up being something that even if it's implemented in the short term winds up being thought of as a sort of never again moment three or four years from now yeah or or even with iran Uh, and and and, you know here a part of this is his the his kind of uh, what is initially at least a fairly uncritical backing of saudi arabia in their uh aggressiveness of various kinds and it's like, on the one hand, yes, neocons like an anti-Iran vibe, and, and Israel does too. But I don't think they, I don't think, I don't think Bibi wants to see an actual regional war right now involving no. Iran. And uh, so this this might be a point in your favor, which is there is an element of the Trump administ- of, of Trump's foreign policy that almost is sort of calling the GOP's bluff on a whole variety of issues, mm-hmm. which is to say. You know, and, and and this goes to both domestic policy and foreign policy, which is to say whatever the Republican Party said during the Obama era, you know, was one thing. And you can argue what Trump very often thinks he's doing is saying, look, you guys were saying this for five or six years. I'm president now. Right. I'm actually implementing it. And I believe it was a, it was on the repeal of Obamacare where where either some one GOP member of Congress who had voted to repeal and replace Obamacare. God knows how many times during the Obama years just flat out said yeah, it's a different vote now because if we vote for it, it'll actually happen. So exactly. that means it actually counts, you know, in a different way. So th- in some ways, what it does expose is, is the difference between rhetoric made in opposition versus rhetoric that you make or policies that you actually implement once you control, you know, uh, the corridors of power. Yeah. And I think Trump, unfortunately, is, lacks the sophistication to understand the distinction between the two. I think that's safe to say. Uh, let me ask you while I have you. Uh, yeah. It's you, link, you. You mentioned this piece I wrote in Vox earlier about what I call mindful resistance. I'm curious. Uh, you, I, I, I don't want to put you on the spot. You probably didn't have a chance to actually read it and, and assimilate it. But I'm wondering if you share any of the premises. One of which was that uh, Trump opponents are a little too reactive, too easily provoked, and freaked out, and and that lets him control the news cycle. And it also uh, feeds the narrative he's selling his base, which is, look at these people. They hate me. They hate you. They have contempt for you. They exaggerate the things I say, you know, and, and blah, blah, blah. And so a, a, a more kind of deliberate, um, reflective approach uh, and, and ultimately strategic uh, approach to fighting Trumpism is in order. Did, did that make sense to you to some extent? So, uh, you know, full disclosure, my wife is now really big on the mindfulness thing as well. So. Excellent. You know, you well, exactly. If she read my book, she should read my book. I, I, should send- sure, I, I might actually have to get this for her as a last minute Hanukkah gift. Um, so this is the Buddhism book. The, it's not the, too late. Why Buddhism is true. OK, I will have to I will have to uh, see if I can get this for her before New Year's. Um, but leave it this way. I, I think without question, pa- part of this is Trump. Part of this is just social media where you have the immediate the, the ability to immediately respond. And God knows I've been guilty of this, you know, from time to time. Um, depending upon, you know, who's doing, uh, you know, something Trump tweets or what have you. Um, I, I do agree that there are, there are moments where the overreaction is, is in some ways just as bad as whatever it is that, that Trump initially did or said, or it undercuts, it undercuts, how do I put this? Part of the reason that, that, that one of the, the otter Asset, facets of the Trump era is that there is so much crap floating around in terms of what this administration has done that it is very difficult at times to sort of step back and focus on what is the really important stuff as opposed to the stuff that, as you say, just gets you going. Um, 
And I do think that the tendency to live on social media and to respond to the urgent rather than the important does create problems for that. I will say that I don't think neoconservatives are necessarily any more guilty of that, by the way. I, oh, I don't no, think I, I never said they were. I, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I didn't. Uh, You're talking about the. Now, the I do think principle. I do think people like Crystal play in. The, they use it. They, 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 they harness, uh, I, I think, misguided enthusiasms to get seven jillion retweets sometimes. But but no, I, I don't associate this particularly with them. I think it's just a human tendency. Yeah. To I have to fight it myself. Right. Well, no. One of the things I've done. So one, like one of the practices I now do, now do on Twitter is at least once a quarter I take a, a a siesta. I find that I need to like go off it for at least a week to sort of reset my brain. Um, and I found that it's extremely useful. Um, so I I don't do it from like on a moment to moment basis. But there are times where like yeah I'm overreacting too much. I need to walk away for a little bit and yeah. and sort of sort of reset you so gotta, i do you I, seem to have a pretty stable twitter personality to me I, I don't i don't think you're in danger of uh going overboard personally i don't know something i <laughs> well you're a bit you're a, you're a kinder judge of of uh of my feed that i think that i am sometimes but leave it this way there are times where I, I like you know i'll press click and then like literally almost like three seconds later I'm like yeah i shouldn't have done that yeah i definitely um, do that so but, we all have those moments i and i do think that trump in particular excels at you know, what he's good at is, is the, in some ways, he's the troll in chief on this point. Totally. You know, and, and the whole point of trolling is to generate sufficient outrage by your opponents that it makes your opponents look potentially unhinged. Yeah. Um, and, and again, it feeds a specific narrative. He can point to them and say, look, they hate us. They said this thing about me that turned out to be wrong. You know, like Dave, this Dave Weigel tweet. Who knows how much mileage he got out of that with his base? He can say, this is a Washington Post reporter lying about me, and they will believe it. Now, I don't so think we, now, Dave, I don't think I think Dave is a totally stable guy. On the other hand, it's the environment of emotionalism that yeah. makes him when he's got a tweet like that. And of course, he believed it. You know, he believed that the photo was legit and he was interpreting it properly. But but yeah. the reason somebody him like you can't wait too long to assess it is in this environment. If you're the first with that picture, you're going to get seven jillion retweets. I guess the way to think about it is the following. So that's a good example. But it raises the the. The question I think Nate Silver has been bringing this up, which is to say that there's this perception that Trump, by doing this, somehow engages in political jujitsu and manages to fire up his base. And this is the way in which he wins. But it raises the rather awkward question of what exactly is he winning? Um, It is true that he has the loyalty of a sufficient core of his base. But by any polling standard we can possibly apply, this is not a guy who is popular. This is a guy who has managed to squander whatever goodwill he got by winning the 2016 election. Yeah. This is someone who for three elections in a row has endorsed someone and had to face the ignominy of losing, you know, first with Luther Strange, then with the Virginia governor's race, and then finally with Roy Moore. Right. This is someone who, by all polling standards that we can currently imagine, is his party is going to face an utter pasting in 2018. I mean, you know, if, if mm. the, the only way in which that doesn't happen is that if the bar has been set so high, the Democrats will be disappointed if they don't retake the House and the Senate, because I don't think they're going to retake the Senate. That's going to be an extremely right. difficult climb for them. And that Not leads. For, what? Well, go ahead. No, no, no. But my, so my point is, there are things that Trump is getting done now um, because he is the president legally. And so as a result, he can do those things. But politically, I don't see any of what he's been doing is terribly successful beyond catering literally to his hardest core supporters and his donor base. And, and enough of political science 101 still persists to suggest that that will come to haunt him come November 2018 and then November 2020. OK, but there is a way to attribute rationality to I mean, the, 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 the crazier crazy like a Fox question is the eternal question with Trump. But if you wanted to make the case that a lot of what he's doing is not as crazy as it sounds, if you think of his main goal as being not to get impeached, right, <laughs> then that requires hanging on to that 35 percent approval uh, level, which will keep Republicans in Congress uh, from impeaching him. Or, uh, or, and, and so if he assumes, as you agree, that the mm-hmm. Republicans are going are to hold the Senate, if he can keep Republican senators, senators and, and people in the lower house, for that matter, terrified of his base, however small it may seem, he can keep from getting impeached. Now, I'm not saying that's it. It's just the only way I can 
make it seem sensible. And I'm not saying it's sensible. He's a very reactive yeah. person. You know, I, so I let me put this way. I think that's too clever by half. I think the way that Trump is, an, you know, if there's nothing that I, you know, we've seen over the last year as a president, it's that he's an extremely reactive guy. And the one thing that, that clearly seems to motivate him is his belief that that everyone is trying to. It, there was that profile that I think it, you know Maggie Haberman and, and Peter Baker and Glenn Thrush did about two or three weeks ago. Um, the one in which I had to like use five different snippets from it for the toddler thread but it's clear that trump you know despite the fact that he's the president of the united states still feels like his legitimacy is constantly questioned because of the way he won and because of the ongoing investigation and so i think that in his mind the only thing that sustains his legitimacy is in fact the support of his base and the one way that bannon clearly still has some hold over trump is to suggest to him that he's alienating his base that if he does that you know, somehow, you know, all hell breaks, which, which politically is accurate. But what it also means is that be, by pursuing that base strategy for as long as he has, he's essentially locked himself in. He can't do anything else at this point. Um, you know, remember back in like September when there was that brief moment where it seemed like he was working with uh, Democrats yeah. on, a, on a couple of things. Yeah. You know, he enjoyed it for about two minutes and then decided, oh, my God, my base hates it. I can't do it. So. You know, he's locked in at this point, which means he will get the 35 percent support from Republicans. Republicans, you know, are well, not going to get completely 80, destroyed. Like 75 percent of Republicans, but 35 percent in the Gallup poll. Right. But, at least, you know, it's it's lower than that elsewhere. But the other I mean, let me put it this way. This is and this this ties everything back together because it goes back to this question of, of the sort of never Trump people. If you think of what happened in both Virginia and Alabama as a blueprint for what will happen in 2018, you are looking at a spectacular wipeout because essentially sort of a few things, you know, will happen in 2018 that will kill, you know, the the, the GOP. The first is you have Democrats exercise like they never have been. So mm -hmm. they're all going to come out and vote in a way that they hadn't, you know, previously in midterms. The second is you have reasonably affluent suburban GOP voters actually crossing over more than they otherwise would have because they're appalled and sick and tired of this guy. And third and most and, and just as important, you have people that would ordinarily be considered Trump's vase not voting, that they just sit on their hands because yeah. they're just tired. I mean, that's it. It's, it's still a year away. I think uh, some depends on how the tax bill is digested. And the truth is, uh, you know, most people get a tax cut. And, mm -hmm. and so we'll see. But uh, although can I just say I do this, this is a pure moment of pure schadenfreude, which is to say I don't have a dog. And I really never had a dog in the Obamacare fight. It's not an issue that I paid too much attention to. But one of the things that when Obamacare got passed was was the Democrats would stress the fact that if you polled individual elements of the plan to voters, it was actually relatively widely popular. Mm -hmm. But the plan itself was not that the plan. Right. had you know, once it was called Obamacare, it was stigmatized. I love I absolutely love the fact that Republicans are now essentially making this same argument mm -hmm. in terms of how the tax plan is going to be received. That their argument is, well, once you look at the merits of it, it'll totally, you know, turn in terms of, you know, how people feel about it without realizing that in some ways I would argue the die has already been cast on this. I don't know. People will look at their tax bills. I don't know. Um, I, I don't I'm think pes people are pessimistic from a Democratic point of view on this. Let me put it this way. I don't think you a president who ran and got elected on what was essentially a populist platform the notion that you the forgotten have been left behind and i am going to take care of you are not going to pay attention to what their taxes are in 2018 as opposed to 2017 i do suspect that what they will notice is what their tax you know minuscule tax cut that they got in 2018 compared to the massive tax cut that the 1% got got I hope you're right. Uh, I'm not sure that that history bears you out, but I, I hope you're right and that they will pay a lot of attention to how they're doing relative to the elites. Let me ask you one quick question. I know you have to go, but uh, yeah. you uh, we in the Mindful Resistance newsletter uh, yeah. in the most recent issue, I think we linked to your piece on uh, North Korea oh. uh, because you you had a change of heart. You had you had been yeah. a skeptic on North Korean alarmism. And now you were genuinely concerned. Is that is that still your view? The, I mean, I'm talking about the prospects of war with North Korea. Yeah, I'm still. Look, there's one of two possible things that are that's going on here. Um, you know, as I said, this is one of the virtues of not living, I think, inside the beltway is that occasionally I, you know, I tend to ignore the chatter that I will, you know, that, that you will often hear if you're down there 
about, oh, there's talk about war, talk about war. And, you know, Evan Osnes, I think, wrote a piece about a month ago saying that he was alarmed about the degree to which the sort of consensus inside the Beltway is we are moving towards war. And Corey Shockey said something a, a couple of weeks ago. I went down recently and, you know, talked to a fair number of people who actually, you know, are have sufficient contact within the Trump administration to where they really seem to think that the, the Trump folks in particular don't think deterrence is going to work, that at some point some sort of military action is viable, which is news because, you know, by any conventional analysis, I simply don't think that's actually true. Um, Barry Posen's op-ed in the, the New York Times a couple weeks ago made, made that clear. Um, one of two possible things is going on. Either A, maybe what, you know, the sort of Trump NSC is doing is trying to con constantly communicate that they don't think North Korea can be deterred with the idea of making military compellents a credible enough threat so that that brings North Korea to the bargaining table. Mm -hmm. The other possibility is they actually don't think North Korea can be deterred, in which case war is the only possible outcome. There, there is a third possibility, but let me add, first ask you, so your first yeah. possibility is that they are spreading the word. They, they're, they, they are through the, the, the kind of, they're, they're whispering to people, yes. yeah, we're serious about this, and, and yes. Evan Osnos is reporting it, and you're taking right. it seriously. And so, but, but that's actually tactical whispering. That's one possibility. Right. That is possible. But as I said, you know, my general rule when it comes to talking about American foreign policy is that if I have to explain something as, you know, malevolence or incompetence, I will choose incompetence 10 times out of right. 10. And so I don't think this is that, that that's too clever by half for this administration. Right. I just, I, this administration leaks like a sieve anyway. And so I don't think this is intentional. I just think this is people saying what they're thinking. Now, the one, uh, the one intelligent and alarming thing that I've heard out of the administration, maybe it was Tillerson, um, was you know I personally consider them eminently deterrable. I don't I don't yeah. think uh, Kim Jong Un is crazy in the sense of suicidal. He right. he is not risk averse. I wish he were more risk averse, but he's not he's not going to launch a strike knowing that the strike would end in the uh, immolation of his entire country, including him right. and his family. I think, but yeah. Tillerson, I think it was Tillerson who brought up the point I've heard before, and it's not nothing. Which is that uh, North Korea needs money, and you can imagine them selling nuclear weapons to uh, a terrorist group or something. To me, yes. that's a much more valid concern uh, than uh, a nuclear war initiated by a crazy, crazy regime. No, that actually, I think, is no, that's always been my, my concern with North Korea. North Korea is not going to give up their nuclear weapons. And there are ways in which you can make the argument that a nuclear North Korea so long as everyone tacitly recognized that that was what was the status quo was going to be, would actually be a source of stability because it means that the North Korean leadership suddenly realizes that they're not going to disappear from the face of the earth. That said, South Korea gets reassured because reunification is not going to happen anytime soon and they can't afford it. China's happy because it means reunification is not going to happen anytime soon and they don't want to cope with a reunified uh, and nuclear armed Korea. Um, but the real issue is, is do they start selling stuff to other actors? Um, I am genuinely concerned about the proliferation threat. That is a valid concern. Mm -hmm. um, and the, and again, it's always worth pointing out the Trump administration. This is one of those areas where the Trump administration inherited the problem. Um, they, this is not necessarily a problem of their own making. No, it's a multi-administration problem. Yeah. Um, OK, well, uh, thank you. And just to, you know, quickly review the subject we started off with, I just want to say it takes a big, big man to admit that he is wrong and I am right. And Dan, I really appreciate your having done that. <laughs> Uh, I will admit that you are, in fact, Robert Wright. Yeah, that's all I was asking for. Um, and you are Dan Dresner, and I think that's your Twitter handle, right? Dan Dresner is my Twitter so handle, So people yes. can find you there, and we've said they should read your spoiler alerts uh, blog slash column in the Washington Post. Um, and also, as a last-minute Christmas present, might I again recommend the Ideas Industry. Yeah, I, I do recommend the idea. I recommend everyone buy that for Christmas and Hanukkah presents, except for Dan, who is going to buy my book. Why Buddhism yes. is true for his wife. <laughs> I will do that. Um, and uh, and thanks. And also, of fun. course, watch you... Dresbert. What? Yes. Uh, do you celebrate Christmas? Yeah, yeah. Well, then uh, Merry Christmas. Yeah, yeah. Same to you. I mean, I mean, not in a <laughs> not in as religious a fashion as right. some on the right might wish but but uh we we uh my wife actually uh is from a town that still does this christmas caroling thing Aww. which i'm mildly ambivalent about on grounds that there are some people in the in the town of uh, other heritages but uh it's still it feels so good it reminds me of childhood so i, I participate 
I have to say, as someone who's Jewish, I, what I always like is, you know, I do, we don't have any Christmas lights. There's no Christmas tree here. We celebrate Hanukkah. We're very good about that. But I do like when other, like when Christian friends of ours do invite us over for like Christmas Eve or like one night to celebrate Christmas at someone else's house. I do appreciate the uh, the Christmas spirit elsewhere. Well, that's good. That's good to know. Uh, yeah. And so if you're ever down our way at Christmas time, you know where to stop in. Oh, thank um, you. Well, well so hap- I, I will just close by saying... Happy holidays to you as well. And and thanks and for, to all of you. Yeah. And, and, and to all of you out there. See you next time.